I don't know if you did it on purpose, but we can't see. Oh, no, I didn't do that on purpose. Thank you. Just forgot to turn on my camera. Appreciate it. Yeah, that would have been a boring video. Just like, looking at my yeah, name. Black. <laughs> okay. Um, Wayne reminded me, I forgot to mention when we were talking about Protagoras, one of the, the people from our last lecture, he's the guy who said man is the measure of all things. And what he meant by that was humans were the ones that got to determine what was the good, the true, and the beautiful. And he went so far as to say not only do humans create and define ethics, but we even created the gods. We created the gods in our image. And this school of thought that he was starting was called humanism. And so this is the ancient Greek form of humanism, which is based on materialistic or, mo well, materialism, we'll just leave it at that, that the underlying substance of all things is physical material and humans are the highest physical material beings. So we get to make the rules, we get to make the standards, we get to say what's right and wrong, what's good and what's beautiful and ugly, what's good and evil. Later, when we get to the medieval period, we have a syncretism happening between Christian theology and worldview and Greek humanism. And this creates a medieval humanism where people see that they are of great value, but it's because they were made in the image of God. So this is very different from this ancient Greek type of humanism. This is like a humanism that's been baptized into Christianity and come out with a Christian version of, of the view of mankind. But then when we get to the Enlightenment and Age of Reason, we have secular humanism forming. And this goes all the way back full circle to the ancient Greeks, where they believe we're physical material beings, and humans get to make the standards for right and wrong, good and evil, beautiful and ugly, those sorts of categories, classifications. So thanks, Wayne, for reminding me that I just know we throw around that term secular humanism a lot, but this kind of gives you the roots of where it came from all the way back to like 5th century BC um, with the ancient Greeks. All right. Today, we get to finally start with the biggies and with Socrates. And like I mentioned earlier, we don't have any writings from Socrates himself, but we have a lot of writings that are at least attributed to him through the voice of his great disciple, Plato. And Plato, um, in many of his books, wrote these dialogues, what are com come to known as Socratic dialogues, where you have Socrates engaged in conversation with people who claim they know something. And I thought I'd go through some today from the Phaedo, which was written, um, the, the context of it at least, is written right before Socrates' death. And let me give you a little backdrop of Socrates. So Socrates is living in, in Athens. Let me pull out our Palmer book here. And so we have the dates here, at least according to Palmer, 469 to 399 BC. So he's living in the 5th and 4th centuries BCE, which this is the golden age of Athenian philosophy and thought. Yeah. Uh, quick question. Are you recording for your YouTube channel? I'm going to use this recording and upload it. Copy. But thank you for reminding me. Yeah, I found that... Um, the quality is pretty good on Zoom, and so I, I don't feel the need for using my phone. So anyways, thanks for, for checking, though. I appreciate it. Um, so Socrates is living in the 5th century golden age of Athenian philosophy, and even though he's living in the context of all these sophists, skeptics, cynics, he is a true seeker. He believes knowledge is possible. He just realizes he doesn't know anything yet. And one of my favorite little stories about Socrates is that oracle at Delphi, um, the one that got, same one that got the king of Lydia in trouble with the Persians, it, the oracle of Delphi de 
declared that Socrates was the wisest man alive. And when Socrates heard this, I, th I could just picture him kind of chuckling to himself, but then acknowledging that it must be true. Because what Socrates knew was that he didn't know anything. And everyone else thought they knew something. So Socrates realized he knew at least one more thing than everybody else, because he knew that he didn't know anything where everybody else thought that they knew something. So there, there you go. He's got one thing up from the skeptics and cynics and, and that crew and the sophists. Um, another one of Socrates' quotable quotes, which has come down to us, they even put it in the movie, The Matrix, and it was in the Oracle, surprise, surprise, in her kitchen above the wall, it said, know thyself. And Shakespeare later adds, and to thine own self be true. But to be true to yourself, first you have to know thyself. Um, it sounds like a simple thing to say, right? But it's probably the most difficult thing you could possibly be asked to know because it is with the self that we interact with and engage all other things. But like the human eye, we use the eye to see everything else, but you can't see your own eye with your eye. Now I can look into the screen and the recording and I can see an image of my eye, or I could have someone take a picture of my eye, but I can't see my eye directly with my own eye. And I think the self is like that. We use it to see or interact with everything else, but we can't turn it and look at ourselves with it. And so Socrates is asking us to do a virtually impossible task, but that is the foundation of all future knowledge and learning. Because unless you know yourself, how can you hope to know anything else? If you can't know the thing closest to you, how can you know something far away? Questions, comments? <laughs> I do have a YouTube video I did a couple years ago at the Joshua Wilderness um, Institute called Meditations on the Self. I think it's like a two hour video, but I go through all these different theories, but you can look for that on my YouTube channel if you're interested, but I, I think we'll move on from there. So Socrates, he had this insatiable quest for knowledge. And so when people would come to Athens, he would be so excited if they claimed that they knew what courage was, or love, or immortality, or beauty, or goodness, or the truth. And he would begin this question and dialogue session with them until both Socrates and the person who claimed to know something realized that that person had no idea what they were talking about. And that's how almost every Socratic dialogue ends with Socrates just kind of being exasperated that once again, we're not going to find out the answer to these things because the people who claim knowledge don't have knowledge. Um, they may have some sort of belief or opinion, but that's not what Socrates wants. He wants this universal, absolute, objective truth. And so what I thought I'd do for you today... Oh, so anyway, so here you have Socrates. He sees himself as the gadfly of the gods. He's like an annoying little fly that keeps buzzing around, messing with people, not letting them be um, complacent and lax in their opinions and their beliefs, but he always loves to challenge, like, why are we doing things this way? Why do we think this? Why do we believe that? Why is our society arranged this way? Why do we have these views about the gods? And some of these questions got him into big trouble, especially his questions about the gods. Because remember, the Greco-Roman gods are very anthropomorphic. And you can easily see how you could make fun or ask questions about the activities of the gods and goddesses. In fact, a lot of them had awful vices, right? Um, horrific tempers, jealousy, anger, drunkenness, lust, um, backbiting, deceit, treachery. I mean, they were had all the virtues of humans magnified, but also all the vices of humans magnified. This is not like the God of the Bible. This is not like this creator spirit who is beyond physical form, who has all these omnis, right? Omni-benevolence, omnipresence, omnipotence. Um, 
God having all these things. This is not the type of gods we're talking about. In fact, there is some speculation that in Acts 17, where Paul is on Mars Hill in Athens, and he's actually mocking the Athenians because he says, I see you're very superstitious people because you have altars to every god conceivable. He said, in fact, you've gone so far as to have an altar to the unknown god because they were afraid they might have missed somebody and they didn't want some god being put out because he wasn't in the pantheon. And so they even had an altar like a catch-all to the unknown god. And some people believed that altar was erected during Socrates' time when a plague had come to Athens and they were praying to all these different deities, hoping one of them would bring them relief. And they made this altar to the unknown god just in case. But some people believe Socrates was actually aware of the gods of the Hebrews or that there was a god beyond the Greco-Roman conception of deity. And that's just speculation right now. But as you'll see, his ideas of the gods is very different than these anthropomorphic Greco-Roman gods, and Greco in this case. All right, so as he's questioning the gods, as he's questioning society, and once again, Socrates that is not a believer in democracy because he believes the mob, the hoi polloi, the majority is wrong most of the time. They have baser appetites, they're less educated, they have more base or carnal needs, and he was advocating for the rule of philosophers or philosopher kings. That's who you want in charge, not some despot, not some military warlord, but a philosopher who's thinking for first principles, who's looking for the good of the whole, and who can use his intellect and wisdom for the good of the city-state. So eventually charges are brought against Socrates. One of them is disparaging or having disrespect of the gods. The other is disrespecting or threatening Athenian democratic society. And the third charge I'm aware of was corrupting the youth, probably filling their head with crazy ideas, right? And he was a favorite among the youth of Athens, but not so much among the elders and the rulers of the city. And so he was Isn't brought on- He's the one whose works were all burned right in front of him? Um, no, I don't believe or, he had any written works. Uh, or maybe that would explain why he doesn't have any written works. But I don't believe he wrote his... There was one that I read about in our book, textbook. I can't remember who it was. I did that reading a couple days ago. His, right, all his books were gathered and burned in a giant pile in Athens. Do you know who I'm talking about? No. If it comes to you, let me know. I'd have to look it up. I don't remember which one okay, it was. So anyways, um, so Socrates is brought on trial and the Athenians ask him what they think um, the consequences should be for his actions. And Socrates, <laughs> I love Socrates. Socrates says, well, first of all, I think you should commission a life-size statue in my honor out of marble. Um, secondly, I think there should be like a holiday in my honor where the entire city gives thanks that they were alive in the same time that I was here with you. <laughs> and as you can imagine, they were not amused. They did not think it was funny and they condemned him to death. But then they felt bad because even though he was annoying, no one wanted to put Socrates to death. He was kind of like an icon of the city. They just wanted them to mellow out and stop being so annoying. And But Socrates, in fact, they actually tried to make it so he could escape. They would leave his jail cell open. They just wanted him to go away. They didn't want to kill him. But because of his view of the city-state, he saw Athens as like his parents. And he says, if my parents want to kill me, the people that gave me life, brought me into the world, educated, taught me, and kind of made me the man I am today, if they're not happy with who I am, then I want to die. I want them to kill me. And so either change your sentence or declare me a free man. And they didn't want to change their sentence. And so Socrates, um, the, the way they did executions at this time was through hemlock. 
and um, hemlock. There's different types of hemlock. This is the herb hemlock, which is very toxic. Um, there's also a hemlock tree, which is not, but it's not the hemlock tree. It's the herb hemlock. And they made a poison, poison out of it that he was to drink. And so the part I want to share with you today from the Fido is the conversation Socrates was having with his young students, friends, and disciples on his impending death. And the topic is going to be on whether or not the soul is immortal. And so this is coming from a pagan Greek philosopher, but he's talking about the immortality of the soul. So already you see how different he is from all the people we've studied before us, because they were all materialist, but Socrates believes in an immaterial part of the body that lives on after our physical vehicle has gone back into the earth, has returned to the elements from which it came. Our soul or spirit returns to God or the spirit realm from which it came. So this is a huge shift in Greek philosophy and it's gonna change everything. All right, so. So did Socrates like not believe in like partial truths? What do you mean? So like, to me, it just kind of like seems like if he didn't know like the entirety of a truth, then he didn't know any of the truth. Oh, I gotcha. Yeah, he was looking for universal absolute truths. And um, later we'll, we'll get to definitions that explain why partial truths aren't actual capital T truths because they're lacking something. And because they're lacking something, the best we could say is they're little t subjective truths, yeah. perspectival truths. But see, even using truths in the plural is problematic. There is only one capital T truth is what Socrates is going for. And, it, and this is where it's really difficult to tell where Socrates ends and Plato begins. Because when we get into his disciple, Plato's philosophy, so much of it seems to be coming right out of at least what he has Socrates saying in the dialogues. But Plato wrote the dialogue. So I don't know if he's putting his thoughts into Socrates' mouth, or these are things he learned from Socrates, and he's putting maybe his version back into it. But remember, Socrates was condemned to death um, for his views and teachings and maybe his overall personality. And Plato did not want to suffer the same fate. And so it could just be Plato's protecting himself by using Socrates as a pseudonym. But I'm not enough of a scholar on these ancient Greeks to be more definitive than that. I mean, this is one of those epic philosophic debates like what is from Socrates, what is from Plato. Uh, to me, it doesn't matter. I just in my mind, I think I just see them as a Socratic Plato hybrid. And this is the realm of idealism and philosophy, but I'm gonna roll that out a little bit later. Where I'm gonna go now is, I don't normally use Wikipedia, but as I was looking to try to see if I could find an online version of the Phaedo, I came across what Wikipedia was saying about Socrates, and I just thought it was really quite excellent. Now, if you want a more academic source than Wikipedia, I highly recommend um, the Stanford Encyclopedia of, Encyclo of Philosophy. And right below the Wikipedia article, at least on my Google search, is the Stanford Encyclopedia. And it is scholarly, it's peer reviewed, it's updated regularly. So it, when you're writing your research or term paper, you can use um, the Stanford Encyclopedia, but not Wikipedia, if that makes sense, okay? Even though Wikipedia is getting better all the time, I still think it's a fine place to start. And then you can look at their references, their resources, and click on those links to take you to more scholarly or academic articles. Also, we have a good library database that you can use where I'm sure we have online versions of these. But anyways, uh, enough of that. So, in the Platon Platonic Dialogues, I want to go on to the Phaedo.
<laughs> now, of course, I can't find the fatal. Oh, there it is. Okay, so the Phaedo, also known to ancient readers as On the Soul, and I just love this. We have these ancient Greeks talking about the soul life, and it's really interesting. And so, once again, if you're coming from, like, a Jewish perspective or a biblical perspective, this is the time period of probably, like, Ezra, Nehemiah, where they've come back from the Babylonian captivity right before that 400 year gap in the scriptures between the Old and New Testaments. So we're right before that happens, not too far away in Athens. And so this is one of the best known dialogues of Plato. It's middle period along with the Republic. And we'll talk about the Republic when we do Plato because that's where he kind of rolls out his political and social philosophy, how he believes society should be run. And he too shared this idea that at the very top of society, you should have philosopher kings. That's who should be in charge. That's who should be ruling. Um, the philosophic subject of the dialogue is the immortality of the soul. It is said in the last hours prior to the death of Socrates and is Plato's fourth and last dialogue to deal with the philosopher's final days. Following Euthyphro, Apology, and Crito. Now, the Euthyphro, um, in, in that book, Plato, or Socrates, is rolling out this dilemma. And the Euthyphro dilemma states, um, it asks the question, is something good because God says it's good, or does God say things are good because there is an objective um, separate template of good and evil that God is looking at and then making value judgments. Okay, so let me give you the dilemma one more time. Is something good because there is an objective standard of good and evil separate from God, or is the will of God what God says is good, good, and what God says is bad, bad? Now, whichever one you pick is going to create problems. Because if you say good is whatever God says it is, then that makes good and evil completely arbitrary based on the deity. So one day God could say, thou shalt not kill. And then the next day God could say, kill every last one of them. Well, what are you supposed to do? Do you go with the last thing God said? The first thing? Do you flip a coin? Do you split the difference? But that's disconcerting to think that Tomorrow, God could give new revelation, and everything that we thought was white is now black, and everything that was once right is now wrong. And that would be really confusing. The other option, though, that there's an external standard of good and evil that God is looking at and then making proclamations, do you see what that does to God? Now God isn't the end-all, be-all, and his word and will is the standard. But now God is subject to some standard outside of himself. So now you have a limited or smaller type of God than a one whose very will or word determines good or evil. But that God, we are under his whims of what he's going to declare. Do any of you have like a solution to that dilemma? Well, like what if the, the whole like good or bad thing is like reflective of God, like reflective of his character. Like he's not limited by it, but it's reflective of who he is. That's very good on him. And in fact, in the scriptures, that's exactly how God is defined as good, right? It's like synonymous. God is good. But that type of good, it's not like when we're talking about good, like that was a good cheeseburger, or I got a good girlfriend or boyfriend, or that was a really good class. We're talking about absolute goodness and how i would define that is that without blemish that which is lacking nothing that which is whole and complete if i had to just define what is the good but that's how i would define god as well that which is whole perfect complete lacking nothing i mean it works right as a, as a synonym but that's how i would describe the true and the beautiful 
And what you're going to see for these ancient Greeks, the good, the true, and the beautiful are all synonyms, but they're also all synonyms for God, the good, the true, the beautiful. Love it. Oh, and is that whenever, sorry, whenever you say like that mankind determines uh, what's good, what's true, what's beautiful, is that like kind of like in correlation to like calling themselves God? I missed the first thing you said. Oh, because like whenever we were talking about the materialist, yes. about how they're talking about how uh, mankind determines what's good, what's true, and what's beautiful. Yeah, is that just kind of like yeah, that like Protagoras. Yeah, but Protagoras was a materialist. He didn't believe in this type of God that Socrates is talking about. So Socrates is in a whole different place than Protagoras. But it seems like they were like calling themselves God without even necessarily knowing what they were doing. I'm missing the the connection there. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of it now. Is if God is what's true, what's beautiful, and what was the other one? Good. Good, then like, if you're saying that mankind is a determiner like, of those things, then mankind is- Socrates the isn't saying that though, that was Protagoras. Oh, well I was just like, kind of like making that connection. Okay. Yeah, and basically Socrates is combating people like Protagoras and he's saying, no, it's not humans that are the standard goodness, truth, and beauty are beyond humans. They're eternal, infinite. They can't be created or destroyed. They have always been there, just like God, because these are attributes of God or ways of describing God. But that's why the Euthyphro dilemma is so problematic. Is this concept of goodness because it is who God is, or is it a standard separate from God that God has to conform to. Obviously, that's not the kind of God that Jews are talking about, right? Or Christians. Um, but for the Greeks, I don't think they ever really thought about it before Socrates brought this up or Plato brought this up in the Euthyphro dilemma. And some people would say, well, God isn't arbitrary. He's not going to say something's good today and evil tomorrow, the same thing. God is consistent. I mean, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But I could give you plenty of examples in scripture where it does seem like God changed his mind or repented, right, of something he was about to do, and he changed direction. And so it is a good question, and I love the dilemma, and I think it's great to ask, especially Christian students as well. Um, from a Christian perspective, you would have to say there is no external standard to God. God is his own standard. Your only hope is that he is a good God and he is not going to just indiscriminately tell us to do things that are evil just because he was feeling it or not feeling it any particular day. Okay, moving on. One of the main themes in the Phaedo is the idea that the soul is immortal. In the dialogue, Socrates discusses the nature of the afterlife on his last day before being executed by drinking hemlock. Socrates has been imprisoned and sentenced to death by an Athenian jury for not believing in the gods of the state, little g gods. So we're talking like Athena, Zeus, Hera, and the gang. Uh, uh, Socrates definitely believed in God or a god. He just wasn't buying into these anthropomorphic Greek gods. He, he agreed with Protagoras. Yeah, you guys just made these up and projected them into the heavens. So yeah, why should you listen to what they say if they're just human projections? But Socrates had a much higher view of God than a lot of his other contemporary Greeks. But that's part of why he got in trouble because he wasn't mocking the capital G absolute eternal God, but he was making fun of the little g gods and goddesses of the Greek pantheon. Uh, let's see. I also mentioned he believed in philosopher kings and corrupted the youth of the city. Um, there's something else unusual about Socrates. Of almost all the philosophers we're going to cover in this book, 
you could probably count the ones that were married on one hand and Socrates was married. He's one of the few, almost every other philosopher is a single white male in our book, which I think we could speculate on why that is. And part of why I think it is, it's really hard to do deep philosophy if you have a wife and children with weans running around and people that need you, or you got to take out the trash, or you got to bring home the bacon, or you got to go play catch with the kids. Well, it's hard if you're brooding in your cave trying to wrestle with the mysteries of the universe if you got all this white background noise going on, right? And so we find most philosophers are single and kind of hermetic, but what a surprise. By engaging in dialectic with a group, oh, and dialectic, when we refer to Socratic dialectic, and this is one of those loaded words in philosophy. It means different things in different times by different philosophers. When we say dialectic in the Socratic sense, it's a conversation, a dialogue, where two people talking back and forth. It's not like one person talking and downloading at another person and the other person is receiving. It's two people speaking together, trying to come to a conclusion. That's what dialectic means. I realized just in the, this past couple years, um, I have a dialectic mind and it was nice to finally have a label for it. So like, I don't care what the topic is, but when someone presents a proposition to me, it could be political, it could be social, it could have to do with art or beauty or religion. As soon as someone puts a proposition into my head, there's something about my mind that I'll have the mirror of it will just immediately present itself. And so I see like the point and then the counterpoint. And then I try to massage or look at a situation from both sides. And my hopes is to get to a synthesis between black and white, this or that, Democrat, Republican, um, atheist, Christian, whatever it is in that dialectic, I'm trying to get to some sort of synthesis. And it's so interesting that what's going on in my head is what Socrates was doing in public with other people. He's having these conversations, trying to find people with different points of view to share perspectives to hopefully together both approach the truth. So that's what dialectic means. Is that clear? Okay, so think point, counterpoint. <clears throat> so his friends include two Thebians, Cebes and Simeus, and Socrates explores various arguments for the soul's immortality in order to show that there is an afterlife in which the soul will dwell following death. Phaedo tells a story that following the discussion, he and the others were there to witness the death of Socrates. And it's kind of humorous. And there's some really famous romantic period paintings of the death of Socrates, where he's like on a divan um, reclining and he has this goblet of poison and he has all his followers around him all emotionally distraught. But Socrates is as cool as a cucumber because of his beliefs of what happens to the soul after we die. He actually sees the prison as a cage and a bondage and a hindrance to truth. And that once our soul is released from this bondage, we have a much better chance of understanding capital T, T objective truth. It's our eyes, our ears, our senses, our flesh that is inhibiting us. It, so the soul set free doesn't have to deal with all these distractions. So apparently, as he's about to drink the hemlock, do you guys know what a libation is to the gods? A libation? It's like a drink offering. So say I'm having a cup of coffee, but I want to honor the, the goddess of hot beverages. Well, I might pour out a little on the temple steps or or in her garden or courtyard as like, here you go, honey, thanks for hot beverages. And so Socrates asks, as he's about to drink the poison, he says, would it be inappropriate to offer a libation of hemlock to the gods? <laughs> so he had a sense of humor, even on his deathbed. And, um, but he had no fear. 
And it's not because he was a Christian. It's not because he had the Holy Spirit. It's none of those things. It's because he had such a strong and clear belief of the immortality of the soul. And he was actually looking forward to death. Now he believed we weren't allowed to take our own lives because it was part of the process and the purification of the soul. But when death was coming, we shouldn't fear it. We should embrace it as almost like the doors of our cage is finally being opened. Wayne. Yeah, that, that concept, um, like pouring out the poison to the gods, I mean. <laughs> That's really funny. I'm a rabble with that. Yes. Okay. So I wanted, I was going to read to you from the Phaedo, but I decided they did such a nice job in this article of breaking down his arguments for the soul. I thought I would share it with you this way, but what I would encourage you, and if we still have time, um, we might read a little from the Phaedo just so you can see how the dialogue works where one people person asks a question, the other responses, the next, it generates the next question, new response, new question response. And it's a great way to ha see how a philosophic principle is being worked out. But I'm just gonna give you like the, the commentary and just cause I think this is such an interesting topic and kind of gives you an insight of the radical shift from monistic materialist to now the Greeks are believing we do have a physical body, but there is also an immaterial, spiritual, non-tangible part of our existence. And they're calling it the soul, or the Greek word for that is psyche, psyche, where we get the word psychology from, right? The study of the soul, of the psyche. The first argument is the cyclical argument or opposites. And this explains that forms are eternal and unchanging. And as the soul always brings life, then it must not die. And it is necessarily imperishable. As the body is mortal and is subject to physical death, the soul must be its indestructible opposite. Plato then suggests the analogy of fire and cold. If the form of cold is imperishable, and fire its opposite was within close proximity, it would have to withdraw intact as does the soul during death. This could be likened to the idea of the opposing charges of magnets. And they roll out the term here forms in passing, but I'm gonna have to pause here a little to explain it for you to understand what's going on. And once again, I don't know if this came from Socrates or if it's Plato reading it back in the Socrates, because we normally talk about the Platonic forms. And um, maybe I'll Google that in a minute. It, there's these Platonic elements. I believe there's, is there seven of them? Eight of them? All right, now I'm curious and I gotta look them up for myself, so quickly. Okay, so here we've got these are the platonic solids. So there's five of them. And these, these are the shapes you can make with repeating shapes. So we see we have the cube representing earth. We have the octadron representing air made out of triangles. We have the dodahedron, which represents the universe or that fiery ether from like Heraclitus at the cosmic Big Bang. That's kind of like what fills the cosmos, that gaseous space. And that's there made with a, is that a penta, a five-sided uh, pentagon, right? Pentagon. And then we have the, I, 
icosahedron, which represents water, and then the tetrahedron representing fire. And so these are the platonic solids or shapes. And just like the atomist and stuff thought everything was built up of these indivisible particles, Socrates or Plato broke them down to these five because these are the shapes that can be made that where they can be fit together with no gaps or spaces in between. So solid things would be made up of microscopic versions of these little things. So this is kind of like early atomic or molecular theory, or I guess a molecule would be two or more of these combined together to form something. Like we mentioned, a human would be a combination of earth, air, fire, and water, because we have all of those elements within us. The fire would be more like our soul or spirit, etc. Where did they come up with the shapes? Well, remember, we already had the Pythagoreans before this. The Greeks were very much into mathematics. And so I'm imagining it probably came out of that tradition. That I was think it's a cube for Earth and not a globe. Or um, a sphere. I don't know. And if you noticed, a circle or sphere was not one of the shapes. Yeah. What, what I found kind of interesting was uh, air, fire, and water all are formed from triangles. Yes. That is interesting. And I don't know why. All right. So the forms, it's not just those shapes. But when we talk about the platonic forms, and I wish I had my whiteboard, but I'm just going to do it with my hands. I'm going to do hand teaching. So the highest realm of reality, and I'm going to put it like hierarchical, hierarchical. So up here is the eternal realm of forms. And everything that has ever existed or could ever exist has eternally existed in this realm of forms. And there's categories up here. And so everything from physical objects to concepts. So we could have love up here, this eternal concept of the good, the true, the beautiful. But it could also be things like a human being, a dog, a tree, a table, a chair. That has always existed, will always exist. Now, what I can't tell from the readings of Plato and Socrates, of Plato is, are these eternal forms synonymous with God or the mind of God, or is it like this separate template that God looks at and then makes the physical material world? And so that's a debate between Platonists and scholars. And later we get Neoplatonism which clearly states that the eternal forms are from the mind of God. And that's why they're eternal, because God has always existed. God has always known everything. God cannot have new knowledge because there's nothing new for God to know. So these ideas would be in the mind of God. And then God speaks these ideas into existence, at least in the Jewish tradition, right, in the creation account. But these ideas were always there. That is the ultimate reality, these ideal forms. And so Plato becomes what's known as the father of idealism. And with his disciple Aristotle, like all good disciples do, he took the opposite approach of his teacher, and he becomes the father of realism or physicalism, where he says, no, it's the physical material world of things that is primary, and we look at physical objects, and then we think of abstract concepts or ideas and put them into these eternal categories. Plato is saying, and Socrates are saying, no. First, you have this realm of eternal ideas. Everything begins with a, an idea. And then we have concepts. And concepts are our thoughts about these eternal ideas. Now, as humans, that's the best we can do, is to conceptualize these ideal forms. But then this physical material world, the world of sense perception, that is actually like a copy of a copy. 
and now you looking at me on this virtual Zoom call, that's like a copy of a copy of a copy. And it's just weird when you think about it. And it's, that's how Plato and Socrates are seeing reality. The most real things are ideas. Concepts are the next most real and then the least real are actual physical material objects. Now he's not saying physical material objects aren't real, but everything that's physical material is transitory. Um, it came from matter and to matter it will return. From the dust you were formed, from the dust you will return. All our physical elements, earth, air, fire, water, ether, will be dispersed again back into the cosmos, but our concepts, this realm of ideal forms, can never be changed or destroyed. Now, common people, according to Plato and Socrates, confuse the world of appearances, physical things, with ultimate reality. That was the problem with the philosophers that came before, the monistic materialists. They saw a rock and assumed that was the physical real reality where Plato and Socrates understood, no, the concept of a rock is more real than the rock, and the idea that we get the concept from is more real than all of them. And that idea of rock will, is eternal, and it will always be there even if no physical rock exists in the universe. The concept or idea of rock cannot be destroyed. And if you doubt the truth of this, um, look around where you're sitting right now, in, in your room or wherever you happen to be. Every physical thing you can see was first a concept or an idea in somebody's mind. That laptop or computer you're working on was first an idea that someone brought into physical reality. Even you were first an idea or a thought in the mind of God before he physically manifests you into the world. And so this is where idealism comes from. And it's also how you would make value judgments. Um, so when I'm in the classroom, what I would usually do is use an example of chairs. We know things are chairs, according to Socrates and Plato, because we have this eternal concept of chairhood or chairness in our minds. Now, it's not perfect. It's broken and flawed because we're humans. We're not living in that ideal spirit realm. We have a physical body, we have physical brains, we have physical cultures, and so they affect and distort our view. But if we think about it using our minds, using our reason, not using our senses, we can conceptualize and define and even evaluate what a chair is. And so if you brought a bunch of different chairs to me, I have an internal template of chair in my mind and I use that to evaluate, that's a good chair, that's a mediocre chair, that's a lousy chair. Because in my mind, I have a template of what an ideal chair looks like. Same thing with people. In my mind, I have a template of what the ideal man and woman would look like and think like and be like. And so when I meet physical human men and women, I'm comparing them to this template in my mind and saying, wow, this one is appro approaching the ideal and this one so far from the ideal, I can barely tell that they're even human, right? And so that is how platonic idealism works. And so you get this really interesting hierarchy from absolute, eternal, indestructible to thinking about concepts of those eternal things and then the physical manifestations of those things. And it's a hierarchy of reality. Ideas are most real, concepts are next, and then the actual physical things are least real. They're all real, but in degrees of reality. These can come and go, these abide. And the concepts are in between. And so the philosopher is trying to get from the world of sense perception, working up to get as close in the conceptual realm to the ideal forms as possible. 
And that's why Socrates and Plato thought philosophers should be ruling the country and not people who are confusing the actual physical chair with the ideal of chair. <laughs> okay, whoo, that was quite a, a monologue. That was not a dialogue. Okay. But I had to explain forms for you to understand his first argument. So sorry about that. But here we go. So the cyclical or opposite arguments is this idea we know from the realm of forms, it's kind of like the um, Taoistic view of the yin and the yang. In this world of form and appearances, everything has an opposite. If something is long, then something else is going to be short. If something is high, something else is going to be low. If something is fat, there has to be a skinny. If something is beautiful, there must be an ugly. If something is good, there must be an evil. So you get these match sets. So, ipso facto, if there is death, there must be life. And so that's the first argument. Life comes from death. Death comes from life. Every living thing will die. It is from dead things that new life comes. And so that's his first. And now you can see even the seeds of reincarnation or transmigration of the soul peeking out. He doesn't come right out and say it, but you can kind of read it between the lines that we have been here before. That's how we know stuff that we were not taught. And in philosophy, that's a specialized word called a priori. So that's a new word, P-R-I-O-R-I, a priori. And what that means, I believe that's Latin, and it means before experience. So these are things you know without having to open your eyes or ears or nose and experiencing the world. It's just simply something you know as part of being a human being. You are born with this knowledge. So it's no basically one has instinct? To teach. Yeah, it's like an instinct. You're like born with it. And what Socrates and Plato are implying is because people come in, humans come into the world with like preloaded knowledge of certain things, it implies they must have learned or acquired that knowledge in another life. Okay, so that's an inference, but I think it's interesting. Another explanation for how we can know things is that before our soul was put in our physical body, it was given like, almost like, think of like a holographic chip. And I'm, I know I'm speaking of something physical to try to explain something non-physical or metaphysical. And metaphysical simply means beyond or outside the physical. But it's like we have a metaphysical chip in our minds, which is like a hologram of all the ideas or concepts that exist. And so with this belief, it means education is really more an act of remembering what you already know. And that's how Plato saw himself. He was like a midwife helping you birth thought babies. And, and that's what I like to tell my students. I'm just this old bearded um, midwife trying to help you have thought babies. And I'm not impregnating you with thoughts. I'm not getting you pregnant with my ideas, having them come to fruition in you. What I'm doing is helping you bring forth the thoughts that already exist inside you and always have, because you are connected to this realm of ideal forms. I guess from a, a Christian perspective, we would say this is part of being made in the image of God. When God made us, he gave us a mind that was different from the mind of the animals. And this high aspect of the mind is called the nous, N-O-U-S. And throughout the New Testament, like in Romans 12, 2, our theme verse for, the, for spiritual life this semester, be not transformed or be not conformed to this world, sorry, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your noose, of your mind. So this is, the logos is that analytical reasoning, the cardia is the passions, but the noose is like this high level, first principle platonic form 
part of the mind. And so Plato and Socrates believe even the most ignorant, uneducated slave or peasant has all the eternal ideas you could ever have in their heads. They simply have forgot them or the trauma of reincarnation or being born into a physical body has made them forget. And so a teacher or an educator is actually helping you remember what you already know. And part of how um, Plato and Socrates would demonstrate this is they would take their class or their, their critics down into the fields where the peasants or slaves were working. And by asking them a series of leading questions, they could solve the most complex mathematical or philosophical problems because they could answer yes or no questions. Fascinating. They simply didn't know the, couldn't remember the formulas or the techniques, but the ideas were already there. This would be like how any person in the world already has an innate template of like good and evil. Now that can be subject to temperament, personality, religion, culture, but everyone in the world has this like value judgment thing going on in their head. And Plato and Socrates would say, it's because you have this template that you're measuring and evaluating everything else against. Let so me give you a quick, oh, oh, go ahead, Autumn. Well, I was gonna say, so do they believe like all this, uh, like knowledge, like they, they were, I'm trying to figure out how to toward this, that they were always connected to that eternal realm. So like, that's how they would know all that information. Does that make sense? No, unfortunately, most people don't even think about or know about it. And they're confusing physical reality with these eternal ideas. And what Plato and Socrates are trying to get people to do is stop trusting and living by your sense experience, but start thinking with your minds, because that is how you access these concepts. And then you use those concepts to evaluate and judge the physical material world. That's crazy how there's like correlations to Christianity and things that you're saying. Well, that's because I'm your professor. If you're taking this <laughs> state or Grossmont, you probably would not be getting these correlations. But later when we get to the medieval period and stuff, a lot of people saw Socrates as almost like a pre-Christ Christian. I mean, they're not saying he was a Christian because Jesus wasn't even incarnated for another almost 500 years. But so much of his insight, they would say, this is like the most wisdom a human could have apart from revelation from God. And I, I certainly do not disagree. I, I think he had incredible insight. And that's why it was very easy later for Christianity to syncretize with Platonism. And that happens in what's called Neoplatonic thought. And when we get into middle medieval Christianity, it's not just like the gospel or coming out of Jewish history and culture and tradition. We have this Hebrew theology synthesized or syncretized with Greek philosophy. And that's what goes into the Middle Ages. And so we get this really interesting Greco-Hebrew hybrid. And I find value in it a lot of people would say, yeah, that's when the corruption began, when the truth of the gospel was corrupted by Greek thought. But for heaven's sakes, the New Testament was written in Greek. And so a lot of those Greek words, like we already mentioned, like the logos and the nous, these are super loaded Greek philosophical concepts. And I don't think that was missed on the Holy Spirit or the New Testament authors. Okay. I think that's interesting, too, because a lot of times we think of philosophy as, like, completely separate from Christianity. But it's cool to think about how, like, God allowed, or maybe, like, I don't know, uh, I guess put him here in order that he can introduce the ideas so that whenever Christ did come and whenever Christianity did come around, we could have a better means of understanding it. So, like, it's just cool to think of how God, like, used him without him even. And many of the apostles and early Christians used this as a way to preach the gospel to the Greeks. Th they could present it to them in terms that they could understand philosophically, even though what they were trying to communicate was something spiritual, something even beyond that realm. 
but it is compatible with a Christian worldview, right? Where you have these eternal things, but then they're mirrored by the physical transitory things on the earth. So for example, when we talk about the tabernacle in the wilderness during the Exodus, and it was covered by different animal skins and different colored cloths and silks and, and tapestries and all of that. Well, that was a temporal shadow of what was going on in heaven. Okay. It, it was a physical manifestation of the eternal tabernacle of God in heaven. If we go to the New Testament and we talk about when Christ was crucified, on, in the physical temple, there was a, a curtain or a veil in between the Holy of Holies and the inner part of the temple or the outer part of the temple. When Christ died, that veil was rent from top to bottom. Now, that's a physical material rending, but it was, it was like a type of what was happening metaphysically where the veil between God and man was being removed in the heavenlies. I mean, which is the greater reality, that heavenly veil that is not physical or the earthly veil, which is made of cloth? Well, I would say that metaphysical veil is much more real and important than some cloth veil being ripped down here. That and reminds so, me of whenever uh, Jesus was like, which is easier for me to heal this man or to forgive him of his sins? Well, great example, because the physical is the manna the physical temporal manifestation of the sin, right? And how it's outworking in our bodies, but to forgive someone in their soul, in the very core of their being, that meant eternal reconciliation. That meant the veil between our noose and God has been opened way better, or that's been healed. I'd much rather have that healed than if I was crippled or physically blind. <laughs> Okay. So, wow, I didn't know that was going to take so long, but I had to explain forms to explain the argument. So his next argument is the theory of recollection. And it ex explains that we possess some non-empirical knowledge. In other words, we have, we know stuff that we simply know without having observed it in the world. So, for example, I have the concept of eternality. Well, I've never observed eternality. I've only been alive, you know, knocking on 60 years. I, how can I possibly even have a concept of the eternal based on my personal experience? It had to come from somewhere. And, and Plato and Socrates are saying it's coming because you have this concept implanted in you from the ideal forms. Or in this case, you learned it in another life and that's why you know it now, okay? It could also be something like perfection. I've never seen a perfect thing in the physical material world ever, but I have a concept of the perfect in my mind. I know what it means, and I know when I'm not seeing it because I have a template of the perfect in my mind. How crazy is that? Let me give you a, a simple example. I'm pretty good about drawing circles on the board, on the whiteboard but I cannot draw a perfect circle. Even if I have a compass or a really precise tool or computer program, I can, we cannot create perfect circles in the physical material world. Because if you zoomed in and looked at them, you would see even if it's little tiny flaws, there are going to be flaws. We cannot make a perfect physical circle in the physical material world. But in my mind, in my concepts, I can tell you and define what a circle is. It's a contiguous line equidistant from a centralized point. So I've described it with words. I can picture it in my mind. I can conceptualize it, but I cannot physically make it in this world. Awesome. So... In another work in Plato's Mino, although um, Socrates implies anamnesis, anamnesis, and anamnesis is the theory that we are born knowing everything, or we have previous knowledge of everything. And once again, it's because 
we are born with like this chip or template of the ideal forms in our minds. We've simply forgotten them or most of them. Is this like pre-reincarnation or is this like the beginning of it? Um, there was a belief in reincarnation already going on in India and with the Pythagoreans, they also believed in transmigration of the soul, which is reincarnation. So, so interesting, right? Because you have these materialists on the one hand, but they also have beliefs akin to pantheism or like Eastern mysticism, spiritualism on the other hand. And all this is going on in ancient Greece. Okay, the next is called um, the affinity argument. And it, ex it explains that invisible, immortal, and incorporeal things are different from visible, mortal, and corporal things. Our soul is of the former, while our body is of the latter. So when our bodies die and decay, our soul will continue to live. And so our physical frame has an affinity to the physical material world, but our soul or our mind has an affinity to the things of the spirit or the things of the mind. So our mind will return to mind, our body, our matter will return to matter. But that sounds just like Ecclesiastes 3, right? Where um, our bodies go back to the earth from which it came, from dust we came, dust we will return in the book of Job, but our soul, our spirit goes back to God who gave it from a Jewish or Christian perspective. So even though Socrates is certainly not a Jew or a Christian, I mean, this is pre-incarnate Christ, um, he is resonating with some of these dualistic ideas of a body soul. And then the fourth argument is the form of life. And it explains incorporeal and static entities are the causes of all things in the world and all things participate in forms. For example, beautiful things participate in the form of beauty. The number four participates in the form of the even. The soul by its very nature participates in the form of life, which means the soul can never die. And so because there's an immaterial part of us connected to this ideal form of soul or spirit, there is a sense in which we will always exist, have always existed, and will continue to always exist. <laughs> and I think we're out of time, but I think that gives us kind of a nice lead in to Socrates and, and we'll transition into Plato and into this idea of forms and I'll try to pull out a manageable dialogue because I at least want you to get the flavor of how Plato wrote and how Socrates worked because it's a great tool and I, I use it in my teaching all the time. Um, I, I think it's a great way to interact with, with students and it kind of breaks down that hierarchy, right? Because now it's not like you have this expert who's like downloading all this data or information to you and if you can regurgitate it back to me, I consider you educated. No, not at all. And this, we are quite equal in that we are both humans. We both have this template of the eternal, the ideal. And I'm simply trying to help you or help us remember what we already know. And I find that a much more effective way of educating than... Um, other techniques I've heard, like indoctrination, right? I'm actually trying to draw stuff out of you instead of putting stuff in you. At least when I'm in Socrates mode. Okay. All right, I'm gonna stop this video. To be continued. <laughs>